Welcome to my live stream. I'm gonna be talking about my last video, which was the automatic bow. So I'm gonna play through the video and I'm gonna pause whenever I think there's something interesting or more, more light I can shed on a subject. Let's play the video. No looking William Tell. Oh. My wife did archery growing up. I did not. But being good at stuff is so 20th century. Put this on and you don't have to aim anymore. So I guess I made an aimbot. When you wield the aimbot, you almost... So there's one cool little detail that I really wanted to talk about in the video, but I didn't get to. This sort of metal foil looking thing on top of the bow. This is a spring. It's, it's called a constant force spring. And it's like a tape measure. No matter how far you pull it out, it always pulls with the same force. What this does is it offsets the weight of the bow for the motor that lifts up and down. Without it, it's really unreliable. And this basically makes it so that it's only having to accelerate or decelerate the mass. It's not having to lift it. When you wield the aimbot, you almost have a superpower. It tracks targets really well. Almost as well as my dog can track treats. It moves the bow to correct for your lousy aim. And when everything is perfectly lined up, Going into this, I wanted to shoot bullseyes. Lame. Multiple bullseyes. Still lame. Which led to bullseyes flying through the air. So we're gonna try all that and maybe hit the world's smallest William Tell. Sweet. <laughs> so a, a lot of people have asked me if that staged or scripted, but she just did that. The original plan for this, I've been thinking about this for at least a year, probably longer than that. What I wanted to do was just have like a, a bow with cameras in it or something so that I could just hit bullseyes that are static. The idea of a bullseye flying through the air is super cool, but it's also really, really hard because if you only have a bow that has sensors that are in the bow, like cameras and whatever, you have a really hard time figuring out where something actually is. So if, you're, if you have a target flying through the air, it's, it's pretty easy to tell if you're pointing at it but it's hard to tell how far away it is and what path in space it's actually taking, which is information that you need to, to lead it correctly and, and all of that. So I was gonna do static bullseyes. I got these OptiTrack cameras, which can do the external tracking really well. That's what pushed me over the edge to, to, to do flying targets. They became the limitation though, because they don't work outside, the sun overpowers them. And so it had to be done indoors and uh, that basically dictated the parameters of the project. <laughs> this project started when I realized there's a hole in my heart that money just couldn't fill. It's 2021 and I can't buy a self-aiming bow. So I built it. It works now, but it took me thousands of misses to get here. There was also some collateral damage. The, the progression of my backstop for the arrows is something that I wanted to talk about in the video, but it didn't, it just didn't really fit. The amount of bins and other things that I just destroyed is really, really high. I ultimately ended up with a super thick moving blanket with a target behind it if I had an idea of where I might be missing and then sheets of plywood. And I still had arrows go all the way through that entire stack up. This is actually also part of the reason why a lot of people commented on how bad my form was and if I pulled the bow back the proper distance I wouldn't punch myself in the face. You want to do what's called a cheek weld where you stabilize your back hand against your cheek but I was trying to keep the draw force of the bow down so I would destroy less things when I missed and so for the compound bow you can adjust the draw length and you can adjust the the draw force which tells you how fast the arrow is going to go but they kind of go together. So if you want it to be lower force so that you're not shooting as fast, you're, you're pulling it like a child. And that's why I was pulling it to here. It's not that I didn't know, it's just that I'd rather do that and hit myself than destroy a bunch of stuff. Although my nose probably took the biggest beating. So let me show you why an aimbot is hard. Hey, what are we gonna do? Our this TV is CNC machined on my router. It's made out of a sheet of MDF. Some people thought that I 3D printed it or something, but I didn't. I, I had to machine it because I could not find a TV. I drove around to a bunch of thrift stores. None of them had a TV. 
And so this is some model off of GrabCAD and the knobs are SLA printed on the, the Form 3 and then the machine is done on the 24R. This sequence, I, I had a vision. It's like, okay, I want to make it like this, this old timey TV thing. It'd be kind of funny and a, a neat challenge. This took me so long to get convincing because if you just take the video and scale it down and put it in a TV, like it just looks completely fake. And I ended up, I found some plugin that was advertised as turn your amazing HD footage into analog garbage. So that helped a lot, but I had to add the glow from the footage on the bezel and reflection of the, the glass on the screen. And without that, it just, it was so fake. It was just stupid. And this took me, this probably added like a day and a half to two days to the whole editing process. I don't know. It probably wasn't worth it, but I, I had a lot of fun making it, which is, I guess the, that's what happens with all these projects. They're not really worth it, but they're a lot of fun. Archery. All right. A lot of stuff just happened. Most importantly, the arrow flew in a curved path. One thing I was really concerned about with this sequence is how can I make it like if I'm going to do sp any kind of illustration in the video, how can I make it not seem like a weird anachronism? Like if I animate on top of the screen of the TV, it like completely takes you out of it. I, I did some tests and I was able to basically do the animation and then cruftify that. And then it made it look like it was some old timey, like 1940s Department of Energy or Department of War video when they teach about transmissions or something. And so that worked out really nicely. Aiming above the target, so when the arrow curved down, it would hit the right spot. The arrow curves more or less depending on how fast it's going. If her hands are off by even a couple of millimeters, she will miss. Three, two, one. Oh. This is, and she really did that. You can't aim for where the target is because it won't be there when the arrow reaches it. You have to shoot where the target will be, which is called leading. But what's really hard is the timing. This arrow was fired 50 milliseconds too late. Isn't that crazy? 50 milliseconds. 50 milliseconds is way missed. It's actually probably more like plus or minus 20 uh, if you want to hit the target. Maybe even a little tighter than that. It's, it's shockingly narrow, the window. That's one third of the time that a blink takes. Let me show you 50 milliseconds. That was actually... 20 milliseconds. I didn't realize that I was exporting the video in 60 frames per second. And uh, apparently a lot of people on YouTube actually counted the frames and called me out on my BS timing. I didn't mean to make it wrong, but uh, oops. <laughs> Did you even see that? Let me do it again. She has to fire within that window of time if she wants to hit the target. It's crazy. And I want to hit moving targets too. So my aimbot is going to have to do this. This is going to be hard. Nice job. I mean, two out of... So yeah, people are asking how long did it take me to perfect my mid-90s look? Uh, it was self-evident. It was pretty clear that you needed a mullet and a stash. We have lots of home videos of my dad, so it was like, all right, well, I just got to do what he had, and it'll it'll work perfectly. And, and it did. In high-res 4K, it looks really ridiculous, but when you add the tape, it's just it just seems right. I don't know. It's amazing. The three? All right, that's enough. My plan is to make a little robot that goes between my hand and the bow. It will move the bow so that everything is lined up just right, and there will be an even tinier robot in my other hand, which can really... The brainstorming phase for this thing was actually pretty long. I probably spent a good week trying to figure out how I could possibly make this device so that I could hold it, so that it could handle the forces. And the big problem in all of this, if we go back to this view, one of the things I was really concerned about, which was actually a, a big limitation, is that even when you put the, the gauntlet on, when you pull way out here, your arm is not made to withstand that kind of torque. It really messes up your elbow. And so when I went into this, I was, I was concerned that it was going to like, literally pull my elbow apart or something. I went on the router and I made a, not origami, but I made a, out of sheets, uh, I assembled a thingy, which was a gauntlet that would allow me to hold a bow offset in a variety of different distances from my arm. So I could test it before I went and built this whole thing. And I found that I could go maybe three inches, three and a half. Beyond that, it just 
completely was like it was really painful and even the the three inches if i did it a lot like my elbow would be really sore the next day that's a big limitation of this and then the other thing is that even when you have the gauntlet and your elbow can survive it it wants to pull your arm in it's a weird force that you don't normally have on your arm and so it's challenging to hold it for a long time if it's fully extended so it, the robot tries to not extend over there unless it has to because you just can't bear it for very long the bow. It will move the bow so that everything is lined up just right, and there will be an even tinier robot in my other hand, which can release the string to fire the bow. One other little note on all this, the little squeaky release, that turned out to be a big problem with this bow. Something that I did not appreciate is how incredibly important any motion that happens, I don't know how many milliseconds, probably on the order of 10 to 50 milliseconds after you release, completely influences where the arrow goes. So if I flinch after it releases, I can actually make the arrow hit a different spot. And e even if the arrow is not touching the bow, if I tweak the bow, it makes the string pushing on the arrow push on a different vector and it'll whip the tail of the arrow around and do all kinds of weird stuff. I was using this little servo that took on the order of 200 milliseconds to open. My body would hear it starting to open, I guess, I would know it was coming and I would flinch and then the arrow would just completely miss. It actually took me a while to teach myself not to pay any attention. And that slow-mo series where I shoot like 10 arrows into the bullseye, that was me not paying any attention. I was looking back and like talking to the wall. Well, it did its thing and it would shoot. So I wasn't going to do anything to mess it up. It's kind of interesting. Oh. The core idea behind this is pretty straightforward but actually designing and making this is going to be a challenge. The uh, engineering tunes that was made on my wife's cricket. If you haven't seen a cricket, they are actually an amazing tool. I usually can do what I need on the laser cutter, but they, they can cut balsa, they can cut vinyl, they can cut uh, plastic sheeting, fabrics, all kinds of stuff. They're super easy to use. I recommend them. They're really nice. I don't think I talked about this in my last video. So the parts come out of the fuse. Those are the, that's the SLS nylon printer. And they come out of it. You can usually get all the powder off of most of the stuff just with a brush. But if you have any kind of crevasses or cracks or anything, bead blasting it is 10 times easier than trying to do anything with a brush. So this is a little tiny bead blasting cabinet and most of the parts that come out of it, I'll bead blast them. You can get them cleaner with a really nice service finish this way. Basically all the parts that I was machining in this project were to adapt these pancake BLDCs to do what I needed to do. This is a motor for a large drone. These motors are designed to have a propeller bolted directly to them so they don't even have a shaft coming out of them. And so I needed a shaft that I could mount a pinion on and also that was long enough to go to an encoder for the feedback. That's how these are controlled. I was trying to use an O-Drive, which is a open source brushless motor to closed loop BLDC conversion thingy. It's really good, super fast, super powerful, and uh, I couldn't get it working, but it shows great promise. So the O-Drive is down here. And then this is just uh, one of the newer Arduinos. I think it's an Arduino Metro. All I needed it to do was to trigger the servo and listen to the button. So I didn't need much there. And then uh, I guess this was another, since we're on the topic of the design still, this rail was probably the hardest part of this entire project because if you think about it, I have this rail which can extend out several inches out and that's trying to bend this entire assembly. Like this nylon arm just wants to just snap in half and, or at least deflect really bad. That made designing this nylon arm so that it was strong enough a challenge, but then 
you you run into issues with these rails as well. So when you when you twist this whole assembly and crank it down, the surface that these little rails are mounted to will distort, and then they'll start to bind up. They really need to not not move relative to each other. So this whole part of the gauntlet is wildly overbuilt. It is super stiff. It's ultra ribbed. This is full of ribs. And this part here is really, really stiff too to try to avoid twisting the blocks relative to each other. Like I don't want the arm to form an S shape. It's really important that that doesn't happen. It's probably beefier than it needs to be, but I didn't want to have to remake it. And then all of the important surfaces on the nylon parts are machined. So I print it and then I post machined them so they'd be flat and parallel and everything. And that's a really good technique for 3D printed parts. You can print the net thing kind of like a casting and then machine to get things really square or whatever. Works on uh, FDM parts, SLA parts, and uh, SLS parts. That was basically the representative issue with the O drive. I spent at least a week on this. I was having issues where I was effectively stalling the motors for a bunch of different reasons. And these motors are made for a quadcopter with a propeller blowing air over them constantly, which isn't happening here. So when I run them at their max rated current, they can really only do that for a little bit before they overheat. I could do it for a spike to move the bow and fire because that's a really short event. But if they would stall, they would burn up. I just kind of gave up on them. I want to go back to it. It's a really great board and uh, it, it can way outperform the, the step motors that I used, which was sad, but I just had to get this thing done. Oh, I spent over a week on the spontaneous combustion issue. We're not even going to talk about it other than to say it's fixed. So you can see well, you not slide this it on view. like this. Yeah, you can see my square peg in the round hole. This is actually, I was able to completely rework this on the mill. So this is super duper, drilled a bunch of holes and machined some pockets and stuff to fit the stepper motor. This one, I just printed this part and is, I was able to get it working. It can aim the bow up and down with this linear axis. You can actually, oops. Sorry, I'm, I'm not great at these controls. So that spring that I was talking about, the constant force spring, you can see it working here pretty well. And left and right with this one. There's a little Kevlar line that's going to the top of this assembly. This is actually, very luckily, I didn't design it this way, but this is basically the center of mass. So I'm pulling right through the center of mass so nothing is twisting or anything. Here's the little robot that releases the string. It does this with a little servo motor. It is super important that the bow always points at my back hand. If it doesn't, then the arrows just don't fly right at all. The arrows with this cheapo bow, the arrows look like that when you launch them normally. Not quite as bad, but these bows don't have enough of a cutout for the arrows to be in line with the string. And boy, do they they flex and go crazy when you fire them. The aimbot hardware is done, but at this point it's pretty much just a crappy heavy bow. I need some kind of sensor that tells me where the bow is relative to the target and a lot of other stuff. There's eight cameras throughout my shop that see everything. They're made by a company called OptiTrack. Here's I cannot get over how amazingly good these cameras are. The amount of time that I've spent trying to make crappy tracking systems for with the Kinect or with the Intel RealSense or 2D cameras. These things, you literally just stick them anywhere, put them on a tripod, screw them to the ceiling. It doesn't matter. You walk around with the wand and they work. Like that's it. Sometimes you have to do the calibration a couple of times if you don't have them set up right, but it is so much easier. It is really a shame that this technology is so expensive because I, if more people had it, I think there's a lot of really cool things you could do with it. Here's how it works. If I hold up this little reflective ball, it's seen by all the cameras at the same time. Imagine this is the ball that I'm holding up and a camera's looking at it from this angle. The camera will take a picture that looks like this. If you project an imaginary tube out from the ball in the image, we know that the ball must be in that tube. We just don't know how far away it is from the image. 
If we add another camera looking at the ball from this angle, we get another tube that the ball could be in, and the intersection of these tubes gives us the location of the ball. And these cameras... The detail that I'm glossing over in all of this is that you need to know where the cameras are. That's what the, the wanding is. You have a, a stick with balls that are known locations relative to each other. And when you wave that all around, you get a ton of pictures from, from all the different cameras. And then they can look at basically the correlation between the different views of the thing of known geometry. And then it does basically a, a, an optimization where it figures out the locations in space for the cameras that would make what they're seeing make sense. And so you can actually see it when you calibrate it. It, it renders it in real time. It, the cameras are like, bleh, they're like nowhere. And you can see them iteratively move to the right spots as the um, calculation converges. So it's pretty cool. And uh, Raya is asking if the balls are retroflective. Yeah. So basically anything that's retroflective works. I shot some of these balls out of my catapults in the last video. And those were actually steel ball bearings, but I bought this, I think it's made by 3M. It's a retroflective spray that you can, I think people put it on their license plates so that you can't see them with the license plate cameras, but they make something you can spray on your clothes that it's basically invisible. I think it's some kind of glass bead, but when you take a picture of it with a flash, you glow like crazy. The other really cool thing about this software that I didn't really talk about in the video is you can just say, if you see three markers in this relative positions to each other, that's this object. So you can stick them on something in any arrangement and then in the software, select them and say like, this is the bow. And then the software will just wait until it sees something where it matches that arrangement and then it'll say, all right, here's your bow. And then it'll tell you the orientation of it and it's all very automagic. The whole time I was using this, I just was like, man, this is so good. If only I had this five years ago do this super fast and the time that it takes to blink they'll give me 50 updates on the location of this ball it's bananas you call these balls markers if you wanted to sound like you know what you're talking about i have those markers are i think ten dollars a piece so you don't want to break them tracking balls on the front of the bow the little grip robot and on the target this lets it know where the bow is pointing how far it's drawn back and where the target is I wrote a really simple program to track everything and shoot at stationary targets. It's this program was basically just doing the simplest possible thing. It was not taking into account any of the dy dy dynamics. It was just saying, here's the target. My bow is pointing here. If I want the vector of my arrow to intersect with that point, I need to move it here and then it would move it there, and then it just did that in a loop, so it would continually ad adapt where it was moving to, and then it had some gains. It was basically a PID. It was accounting for the drop. It's time to see what this thing can do. Yep, that hurt. I actually cut my face. I I don't know if it's visible in the video. There's actually a, uh, another big problem. The part that moves next to my knuckles, I designed it like one millimeter too close to my knuckles. And so sometimes it would just like cheese grater my knuckles. And so my knuckle got really messed up. I tried to file it down and stuff, but I just, I couldn't take off enough material. And so throughout the project, my knuckle got in increasingly bloody and nasty and there is a couple shots where it's a close-up of my hand and it's like really disgusting looking through the power of uh computer wizardry and special effects i removed the, the gore because it was too disgusting i'm putting all that force into the string and then it releases without any warning and i punch myself i'm trying really hard not to punch myself but i punch myself this, this was interesting. You can say like, I'm not gonna punch myself, but this happens faster than you can react. By the time you even notice that it's fired, you've already punched yourself. So there's nothing you can do about it. Oh yeah, and it's also totally missing. I really should probably move these out of the way. I wanted to communicate my struggle with this problem. 
so I made a movie trailer? I don't even know anymore. Some say he's still in there. Please tell me that was a fluke. Do you ever plan to let me go? Why won't you just work? I don't know exactly how I ended up making that. I, I think there's a confluence of a few different things. I discovered a pack of sound effects from all the movie trailers, like the ridiculous bass drop sound and the, the kuh, kuh, kuh. And I really wanted to use those. And then I was thinking about how I had the I know what you did last week joke in there, which I thought was kind of funny because that's basically I spent a week on that problem. And then uh, I was thinking about how hellish it was and it just kind of all came together. And I was like, oh, well, I can maybe cast a mood with a movie trailer or something. It was a fun little, fun little diversion. Uh, I don't know how effective it was, but a lot of the stuff in these videos just you know, it's interesting and fun and hopefully entertaining. That was my week. I was stuck in integration hell where all the pieces work by themselves, but you put them together and they try to kill each other, just like children. The biggest problem is that it just won't shoot the right spot. I haven't proven conclusively why this happens. I'm pretty sure that this was the Archer's Paradox. I recorded a bunch of data and it basically... I show a visualization of it later. In fact, it might even be here. Let's see. It is shooting up in the left almost every time. I could shift things over in software, but if I do that, I'm gonna... I guess I don't show it till later. I'll point it out. But there's a visualization that shows the data I collected where it shows where the arrow is pointing, where the target is, the bow is aiming right at the target. Everything's perfect, but it goes to the left. So I'm pretty sure that this is basically the arrow whipping around the bow and getting shoved to the left and just hitting up into the left. And just hide a bug that's going to bite me later. But I won't tell if you don't. All right, let's put this thing to the test. Hey, wife. Auto bow versus wife, three shots each, best shot gets the point. <laughs> Come on. She's very pregnant, so she had some difficulty uh, with the bow. And then the other, the other thing that was actually really hard for her is that archers never ever shoot anything this close. You know, this is like 20 feet or something. That is just not something you do. And so I think it's outside of intuition and, and other things that, that they're used to. But she still did pretty well. And here we go. I need my binoculars. Oh, I'm closer. Depends on how you measure it. I had a valid point there. So <laughs> I cut it out because it wasn't, wasn't interesting, but I'll say it now, which is I was claiming that if you use the Manhattan distance, I might be closer. If you're not familiar with the Manhattan distance, you can look it up. There are other ways of measuring it that might make me the winner. Just saying. Darn, I thought I was closer. <laughs> I was hoping for like a tie or something. But wait, if I hit this, I win everything. Do you go around looking for the biggest app we could possibly find? No. Mm-hmm. So the way this setup worked is, so this table has markers on the four corners of it, here, here, and then you can't see the other two. From this, I know what direction up is, and then I know where the center of the table is. So if I put the head in the center of the table and I know how tall my head is, I can deduce where the apple must be. And so that's how I'm doing it. What I was originally going to do is put markers on the head and then maybe like around the apple or something. And what I really wanted to do was launch the head through the air and hit the apple off it. <laughs> I didn't end up doing that because I didn't have a head launcher. So I was either gonna have to have my wife down there throwing the head over and over again while I tuned my uh, code and got it working, or I was gonna have to build a head launcher, which I didn't feel like doing. And so I just went with the static head and called it a day. There's obviously some room for improvement here. You can see the markers cool leaping. To fire it. Yeah, maybe, is it gonna make me miss? No, it's not gonna hurt your aiming. Grip error, check hand. 
Ow. I was really disappointed. I, I was hoping she'd really get clonked right in the face. And, and actually, the reason she said ouch wasn't from punching herself in the neck. It was she was holding the grip with her finger directly behind the servo horn for the servo. And there's a piece of music wire that connects the uh, the release to the servo. And that stabbed her directly in the finger. Just went like, is really sharp from cutting it with the plier or with the diagonal cutter. So it just went straight into her finger like a knife. Kind of a double whammy, I guess. Quit hitting yourself. Quit hitting yourself. Quit hitting yourself. We got a bit sidetracked there. Let's get back to making this work. The bow is just not shooting the right point. I'm pretty sure it has something to do with the software. So there's a third monitor joke here that I really enjoyed. Someone was asking how much joy I get out of thinking of those third monitor gags. It is extremely satisfying when you have just the perfect thing to put on your monitor that is related to what you're doing it is it is a source of great satisfaction. It's one of those things where you can spend a lot of time just like thinking about it. I try not to. Usually I'll be working on the project and thinking about what I'm going to show and what the story is and everything. And then I'll, I'll be like, oh, that would be perfect. Put on the monitor, I write it down, and then I, I do it later. That's usually how it happens. And then Michael is asking, where do I rank this project in my list of most dangerous creations? I don't think this was particularly dangerous. The reason why I say that is things like the bat, they can be armed or they can have energy in them. Like they can have a, a shell that didn't fire or something like that, and you don't know it and you can walk in front of it or put your hand on it or something, and then it can blow and unexpectedly maul you. A bow, you have to draw it back. There's no way to leave the bow drawn. Like I can't draw it and then go walk in front of it or mess with the coat or something like that. I'm holding it. And so the only way that it can really hurt me is if like the bow exploded. Now I could shoot someone else if you are treating the range as a range and you just never have anyone down range when anything is active, it's pretty easy to be safe that way. You know, even a project where I use the table saw a lot <laughs> compared to this one is a lot more dangerous than this project. But I'm not gonna debug this and try to figure it out. I still need to make the bow track moving targets and all of that, so I'm gonna just nuke all of this code and hopefully replace all of these old problems with new and exciting problems. So this was actually an intentional choice. I had never interfaced with the OptiTrack before. When there's a lot of unknowns, when, a, when you go into a project, whether it's CAD or, or software or something else, you don't know enough to write it in a sensible way and unless you just continually rewrite it as you go. And so what I did here and what I do with a lot of projects is I just go for it and try to get a prototype working and then I'll throw it away and redo it and then I know enough to actually do it in a pretty good way. This is a good technique. Most of the stuff I CAD, I will just go in and do the worst solid modeling you've ever seen just to figure out the shapes and sizes of everything. And then I'll redo it once I have that and then I can do it a lot better. One week later and I have nothing to show you because software development is very boring, but it's ready to test. And I have a super awesome voice activated target launcher. All right, pull. <clears throat> in the next 500 milliseconds, a lot is going to happen. The bow is drawn and ready to fire. I'm pressing this button, which tells the computer to fire at will. I really like how this sequence turned out. I was trying to explain what was happening without just drawing it on the iPad. So I was trying to communicate it all with, with a series of slow-mo shots of what goes on. And I, I think it mostly works, although I was limited how deep I could go just because it's hard to illustrate some of these things. The tracking system sends the computer an update on where everything is every three milliseconds. When the computer sees a target, it checks to see if it's moving in a parabolic motion. So what you wanna do is you have a bunch of locations that the target has been in at some time. And you wanna say, if I fit a parabolic shape to this, how well does that parabola fit? In particular, does the curvature that the parabola has, is it consistent with gravity? Like it, that would, indicate it's following a ballistic path. What you don't wanna do is collect a bunch of points where it's sitting still before it's been launched. It starts to get launched. You try to fit to it, but there's a bunch of points that aren't a parabolic trajectory connected to points that are. 
So you want to detect it moving in a parabolic trajectory immediately when that happens and reject all that other stuff. So there's a number of heuristics where if it's not moving, if uh, the fit is terrible, it will just throw away points that it's collected. And then it'll look at a portion of it and see if that looks like a parabola. And then at some point, that fit is good. It usually takes a few points, like four or five. And then it'll chop off everything before that, and it'll kind of lock onto that and then start broadcasting forward. This works really well, especially with these cameras because they're so accurate. They have really good time resolution, really good spatial resolution. I also can calibrate it so that gravity is actually aligned with the z-axis of the coordinate system. From that, you can start doing predictions of where it's going to go. That's what the red line is. And then it does a tedious little calculation to figure out where it should move the bow to intercept the target, taking into account the time to move there, release the arrow, reach the target, and the curved path of the arrow. This this was a really annoying computation. I, I actually couldn't find a reasonable way to compute this other than to sample. If I look at the point one millimeter in front of the target, I can't physically move the bow so that it's pointing there before the target gets there. So the first thing I'm trying to figure out is what's the first point that I could possibly move the bow and aim at uh, before the target passes that point. So I try to calculate that, and then I start at that point, and then I march forward every like few millimeters, and I say, okay, if I wanted to hit the target when it was here, where would I need the bow to be pointing? And then... I just keep going along the curve and I try to find the point that is the slowest velocity of the target. So if I can get up to like apogee, the target goes up and slows down and then comes back down. If I can shoot it there, that's the easiest point to hit it. So that's, that's its first preference. Sometimes it's just too high or that's really far away and it can't reach it. <laughs> I actually shot over my backstop a number of times, which is pretty funny. And so, so it does that. Then it says, okay, if I can't hit Apogee, what's the closest point? So rather than trying to move up and intercept it just after Apogee or something like that, if it's going to go up and over, can I just move to the left and then intercept it? If it can do that, it'll prefer to do that. And then calculates based on the draw of the bow, how fast the arrow is going to be going, and then how long it takes the little servo thing to release and then how fast the target's going, and uh, I guess those are the main things. And that's how, how much it has to lead, how much time it has to lead. And so getting this all dialed, especially getting the calculation for how fast the arrow is gonna go versus draw was critical. I had some approximations for the release time and the flight speed, and it would always miss. I had to measure these. And once I got those dialed, it was really quite good. This takes about a thousandth of a second, and then it starts moving the bow. And then it repeats this over and over again as more tracking data comes in, which allows it to adapt for things like the shaking of my hands. Oh yeah, so that's one other aspect of this. So there's a point where it's trying to go to intercept the target. As more data comes in from the target moving, it refines the prediction of where the target's going to be. And then also my hands move, especially when it, when it launches the bow to the side with the motors, it, it pushes off my hand and it often moves like 75% of the distance that it was trying to go because it pushes my, uh, my hand away. Every iteration, every 360th of a second, it will re-update the target. And then it was effectively running a PID. There was a little bit more going on in the controller. In particular, it was looking at the motion of the bow if I know that the bow is moving sideways at 0.5 meters per second, after I release, it will actually be in a different spot than I was when I went to release it. And so it will account for that. It'll look forward not only to where the target is and the leading, it'll look forward to where the bow will be based on the motion of my hand to zero that out as well. And so that works pretty well as long as I'm not like vibrating my hand. If, if I'm moving the bow or changing speed faster than a couple hundred milliseconds, which I don't really do, then it breaks down. But that was a nice little addition. When it thinks it's aiming at just the right point, it waits until the timing is just right. And then 
completely misses. I don't know why I love that joke. It's so good. I've probably seen that 500 times. It's still hilarious. Um, someone's asking, do I take the pull force into account when calculating the speed of the arrow? Yes. So what I did is I had a fish scale and I measured the pull force of the recurve bow at a bunch of different locations. And it was extremely linear. It was much linear than I was expecting it to be. And then I used that to calculate the stored energy in the bow. And then I looked up online how much of that transfers to the arrow as a correction factor. And then I computed the speed. Knowing the weight of the arrow, I was able to compute the speed. And then comparing my prediction of the speed to the actual speed with the high speed camera, it was really accurate. It was within like half a meter per second, roughly. And then the thing that I wanted to do, which I just never got around to doing is that the cameras are fast enough to track the arrow. Like you can put a tracking ball on the arrow and not only get its trajectory, but its speed and everything else. The reason I, I actually did this a couple times. It was hard to make an arrow where you wouldn't destroy the tracking ball. And then of course the tracking ball changes your results. So I just never really did it, but that would have been a cool way to collect a bunch of data from a bunch of shots and get a really accurate prediction of the speed. My wife Catapult was getting pretty tired of waiting an hour for me to fix a bug that I said would only take a minute. So I built this automatic catapult that's going to let me test as long as I want, and I'm the only one. I built like nine or ten catapults right before this. This thing was a this thing was a champ. This thing must have fired thousands of times. I went back and forth and back and forth. I had it down to a science. What honestly might have been worth doing, given the amount of time I spent, like loading this and going back to the bow and resetting it and loading it is actually building a magazine that holds 10 targets or something. And then uh, you'll notice there's some unnatural motion of the target. What I actually had was the target had a, a thin Kevlar line attached to it that stopped it a few inches above the floor. And then that went up to the ceiling and there was a spring. And so that it would launch them when they would come down, they would not smash into the floor and break the target or mess up the balls, the retroflective markers. And that that's why you see it bouncing around. You could maybe use retroflective tape on the arrows. I didn't try that. I It should work. One that's gonna suffer. As expected, the new code base is chock full of exciting problems. It's really cool looking For when example, it hits the Why is it firing sheet. too early? Why is it firing too late? Why won't it hit the target when it's sitting still? Why did it one hit KO my microcontroller? It would just like track the target no matter what. I was pretty permissive with my fits. So when the target's like bouncing around and doing stuff, it would like be trying to hit it. <laughs> and that's why it hit my microcontroller. I eventually just put a, if it was below a certain height, it just wouldn't track it. And that allowed me to be aggressive with my tracking and tuning, but not do that stupid stuff. So many bugs. But it's only a matter of time. We're knocking those bugs out. We fix the microcontroller. We destroy targets sitting still. Now we're getting really close. At this point, I'm pretty sure... This is a view of one piece of the data that I was talking about earlier. These three balls represent the arrow and the bow. These are the trackers on the bow. This is the grip. And then this is the prediction of where the arrow will go. And then this is the target that it's trying to hit. When it would fire, everything was, was great and it would still miss. And that's why I have concluded that it probably was the Archer's Paradox. And then one other interesting thing maybe that's worth mentioning is that some people have messaged me saying, well, no wonder it's not aiming the right point. Your tracking markers are up here, but the arrow's down here. And what I actually had and this is really important is I had a special arrow that had a marker on the butt and the tip and I would put that into the bow and then I would use that to calculate basically the rigid body transform from these three points to where the knock of the arrow is and then from these points to where the center line of the arrow is. That was much more accurate than just trying to measure it with tools or basing it off just the the geometry this measured it very accurately and so if i 
change the grip or mess things up, you would just put the calibration arrow in it and then recalibrate it. And that worked really well. I'm pretty sure the software and the robot are doing the right thing, but the arrows aren't going where they're supposed to go. But I think I know why. I've been using a recurve bow, which comes out of the box with a fundamental issue. You have to fire the arrow around if you don't know about this effect, there's a there's a video from Smarter Every Day talking about this. The basic idea is that the string is pushing the arrow so that it wants to go through the bow, but for old school bows, the arrow has to go around the bow. And what actually happens is that somehow the arrow bends around the bow and can shoot like in line with the the bow where it shouldn't be able to shoot and it causes all kinds of crazy stuff people spend a lot of time tuning arrows and all sorts of stuff to try to make the thing very accurate at known distances and uh, i just didn't want to be bothered with that and that's why i moved to the compound there is some of this with the compound but it is much much less around the bow this makes the arrow do crazy things and even crazier things if you're using the cheapest bow that money can buy. Theoretically, I could calculate what's gonna happen and correct for this, but we're just gonna buy our way out of this problem. This is a compound bow. It's very powerful. Oh. That shot right there, I had been using the recurve with a rubber safety tip on the arrows, which would just bounce off the foam. I put a rubber safety tip on the arrow in the compound I really lowered the draw force. You can see the, the bolts. If you're familiar with compound bows, these bolts are what set the draw force. It's way down. Uh, and it just went straight through, through the bin and out to another bin <laughs> and destroyed a bunch of stuff. It didn't actually hurt any of my, my actual things, but it destroyed a bunch of bins. It was pretty funny, but it was, I was pretty annoyed with myself for, I don't know, it was just dumb. Oh, why did I do that? And it shoots arrows really straight. It's pretty much a drop-in replacement for the other bow, except for one problem. <laughs> this thing is really heavy. You can see my retro reflectors. So these are nominally centered around the arrow. There's actually a little calibration disc. It goes around the arrow and you put it in here and then you can adjust this ring and bolt it down so that it's really close. But then even with that, you can get more accurate with the calibration arrow. So we're gonna do something about that. If this isn't an aimbot, I don't know what is. I was really hesitant to put this thing on. I don't know why, it really felt like cheating. Uh, when I make these projects, I, I construct a set of rules in my mind, like I'm gonna hold the bow, you know, it's a bow that you can hold, or it's a golf club that's self-contained, or something like that. And having this thing, it felt like it was taking me away from my original goal and sort of undermined it using the steady rest. But I was okay with it because one, I just, I, I had to have it. The thing was too heavy. The only way I could not have it is to completely redesign it to be lighter, which wasn't worth it. And then it wasn't actually really helping me be steady so much as it just helped me hold the bow. Like the steady rest it is amazing. It is so smooth and floppy and so you can shake your arm like crazy with it this thing supports all of the weight of the bow so that all i have to do is hold it in place this thing shoots so much better than the recurve so you can actually see this kind of feels like cheating you can see the uh, bow locking in on the target and firing if you watch closely this thing shoots to the right locks so much and better then than fires the and in the precision mode that it's doing there, it could have fired a little bit earlier, but it waits for the velocity of everything to settle. So the grip, the bow, it wants those to be very close to zero. It can do the forecasting that I talked about before where it looks at how the bow is moving, but it is more accurate when you wait for the velocities to settle. So that's what it's doing there. Curve. This kind of feels like cheating but we're way past that point. I think it's time for another round of Beau versus Wife. Hey, wife. Whoa, what are you wearing? It's engineering. What does it look like? Body armor with a snake. You ever seen an engineer before? Same thing as before, whoever's closest gets the point. 
I brought this. There's one other neat little thing with this. I guess you can't really see it. I had to modify this steady rest. Uh, there's a big problem when you take the bow off of it. When there's no weight on it, it just like, bing, shoots up into the air and it's really bad. You can nail the bow with it. And so there's this part I had to make. Maybe you can see it in some other shots. You can look for it if it's interesting, but it basically allows me to lock and hold the steady rest in a lowered position so that I can load and unload the bow. And that worked pretty well. It did, there's a couple times where it didn't lock and then the whole thing like exploded like a clock in a cartoon, you know, where all the gears come out and everything. It's just like, and like punched me in the arm. But overall, it's pretty good. Speed down and have it running in sharpshooter mode. That's three points for the aimbot. I didn't actually do anything, but it feels... Uh, this You can look up this reference if you would like to see some true culture. I think it's Big Rigs Over the Road Trucking is the game. There's a very famous uh, English misspelling where there's a trophy with three handles, which I couldn't find uh, footage of. And whenever you win, it tells you that you're a winner. That's what I'm referencing here. Feels like I won. All right, it works. Let's do stuff. We're gonna try William Tell again. I have a little apple. Hopefully this is acceptable size to you. That's not an apple. It's an apple. And we're gonna shoot. It's actually a plum. It. All right, don't move. <laughs> no looking William Tell. Oh. Boom. Let's do that again. When these things finally work, it is so satisfying. And this this type of stuff is where I was just blown away by the OptiTrack because this is the type of thing that if there's any inaccuracy, it just doesn't work. I was moving the cameras around, I was taking it to the range, and it just worked. Again. I need more. Okay, that's pretty cool. It's time to show what this thing can really do. Moving targets. So you can see it going for apogee there. It pushes the bow up because it thinks it can intercept and get it. It spanked the vinyl decals off the the target. I kept destroying these targets. There was an evolution. The original target was laser cut, multiple rings that were painted and then glued to a backing sheet. And I, I kept destroying them so they got simpler and simpler so that I could make them really easily. Ultimately, it was just some thin plywood that I laser cut with vinyl decals to give it the rings. Normally, I wouldn't bother with the rings, but it, it seemed important. Oh, nice face there. So these lights back here, I got these used. I can't remember what brand they are. It's basically a giant heat sink with some LEDs on it. And I found these used for like a third of the normal price, but these were the only reason that I could capture that high speed footage. The, the high speed camera wants basically all the light. It really wants sunlight. Normally when I'm taking high speed footage, I have two lights like six inches from whatever it is I'm getting footage of and the camera stuck with the lights right next to it. And that's the only way I can get enough light. These are so bright, I can actually illuminate the target from behind me. They're so powerful and they have some really cool holographic lenses. So you can put a holographic lens in front of it. It's just a thin sheet of plastic and you can make it be a wide or narrow beam or whatever. They're really, really quite amazing and they came just in time for this project. I wouldn't have been able to get any of the high speed without them. See the 
high speed camera going nuts. That is so awesome. Oh my goodness. I just love seeing it compute where the target's gonna go and then intercepting it. It's so cool. So that was a case where it couldn't reach Apogee, so it just shortcuts it to the side. There is one more thing I really wanna see. He has no idea what's coming. Maybe he does. There's nothing to worry about. We're just gonna shoot this tiny apple off his head. To hit William Tell Nano, we have to be able to hit not only bullseyes, we have to hit the exact same spot on the bullseye every time. This is the best that I can do with the bow, so we're not gonna be able to do it every time, but we should be able to do it sometimes. Look how close we're getting to splitting another arrow. It wants to real bad. All right, he's got his safety goggles on. Terrible shot. This is just embarrassing. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Looks like you got him right in the heart. That actually really messed up my target. It shoved the Lego man into the target and took a chunk out of it. But I, yeah, it was worth it. Kill shot? 100%. Oh yeah, you did. Everything important. We removed the apple, but it wasn't quite the surgical removal that I hoped for. Let's try it again. I couldn't believe that this worked. So I actually put these out of order. This was the first one that I did, I nailed it. And then I did it again trying to get some higher speed slow-mo because the air is going so fast, it's like three frames. It did remove his arms and legs again, but I think this is about as surgical as we're gonna get. This bow is really cool, but it could be a lot better. In fact, I'm already working on a V2, which I'll talk about in just a second. Before I get to that, I wanna talk about this video sponsor. I would normally Ford skip the sponsor, but there's maybe some neat stuff to talk about there, so we'll just go through it. Opportunity that could literally change your life. And I know that sounds really hyperbolic, but I did the thing I'm about to tell you about nine years ago, and it completely altered the trajectory of my life. So check it out, and you just might change your life. This is a very unusual spot. So this is actually up in Boston. This is at the headquarters for Form Labs. This is the print production room. So they make all these sample parts and things for people. They make a crazy amount of them. Sponsorship. It's actually for an opportunity. And it's with Form Labs. It's a really, really cool so room. Orange. The machines over here, these are, one of these days I'll get my hands on one of these. These are a huge SLA printer. It's called the Form 3L. They're really cool. You can print like computers and monitors and really big stuff on them. But for me, really big functional parts. I think that'd be really sweet. Around me. All those really nice parts that you see on my projects, those are made on these machines. They're 3D printers. They're some of the best. So I, I worked on the design of these and the Form 3. So I was running that program. When we were designing the Form 3, we made the optical module in it. There's a removable thing that has all the high performance optical crap in it. This machine uses the exact same optical module as the Form 3. There's just two of them instead of one. And the advantage of that is you get a module that's been designed and tested for like thousands and thousands of hours, and you can just put it in the big machine. You don't have to remake it and retest it. And if you improve it, it improves both machines. So it's pretty neat strategy to get kind of two machines for one. Um, and someone's asking how much resin to fill a tank that large. Uh, I don't know exactly where it landed, but I think it's about a liter in the world. I've used one on literally every project that I've done. I actually worked here for eight years developing these and other machines. I'm up here right now for the annual hackathon where employees build basically whatever they want. This machine is actually, it's moving a, basically a sheet of glow-in-the-dark film up and down at like 30 or 40 hertz. And this is, this is actually inside of a, a Form 2 printer. So it's the Z-axis of a Form 2 except for up top, there's an O-drive with a really overpowered motor that just moves this thing up and down super, super fast. And then there's a laser Galvo scanning out frames at different points in time to draw 3D objects. It's sort of the equivalent of that uh, Jero Beam Fenderson. If you've ever seen the guy that draws on an oscilloscope, I think he had a Kickstarter about it. Same thing, just in 3D. 
Really, really cool effect to see in real life. You can check out all the jobs at formlabs.com. Okay. This bow is cool, but I want more. I want to be competitive with real archers. Someone was asking about this in the comments for the uh, Patreon post. And I did set up all the tracking cameras here. They have an incredible range. They can see basically from where I'm shooting to the target. The tricky thing with setting up all the cameras is that they, they all have to overlap. So I need cameras looking at me, I need cameras looking at the target, and they need to overlap quite a bit so that they can knit together into one homogenous volume that I'm tracking. And so it was a bit of a pain to figure out the right arrangement, but once I had the right arrangement, it worked, no problem. Like I was saying before, once they're in the right position, you just put them anywhere. So they're just on tripods, throw them out wherever, wave the wand and you're good to go. The downside of this, this is 60 odd feet and I wanna go longer than that. And I there's no way that uh, I can go to like 200 feet or something like that with this setup without a ton of cameras. So I have some thoughts for V2 that I can do this with the cameras. There's also some other ways that I can do it without the cameras. Haven't decided yet. What I am gonna be doing is improving the bow so I've, I've ordered a much better compound bow. It's a, a target bow. The key for the really long distance is extreme, extreme repeatability for its pointing. I'm not gonna get into what that would look like here, but it's a completely different design than what I have with this bow. And I think, we'll see, I have to build it. I think it can be substantially better accuracy than this one. I actually took this bow to a local range, but that's a story. The first shot that I did at the range, you know, like all the people are there and they're like, oh, this is so exciting. This is so cool. Wow. The technology, it's so good. And the the cable for the release got caught in the cams for the compound bow and it popped the string off and everyone's like, oh no, because <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, bow destroying event sometimes. It was pretty funny. It was like the hugest air coming out of the room ever, but they're able to fix it. It's no big deal. Story for another day. What you need to know is that William Tell Nano is the key to everything. Huh? When you push the target really far away, small errors become big errors. If I want to hit bullseyes at 60 feet or 150 feet, I need to be able to hit this apple every single time at this. That was actually the origin of William Tell Nano is backing out the accuracy that I need at a shorter distance to hit very accurately bullseyes at a long distance, it turned out to be a little bit bigger than the Apple for William Tell Nano. And so that became my little target to see how well I was doing. And so you can see that I can't hit that every time. I can't hit a bullseye at distance every time. Although at the range, I was, I was doing pretty reasonable, but not good enough. I wanna like be competitive ideally with like an Olympic archer, but we'll see if I can do that this distance. Plus it's awesome. I think I need to make a version two and I kind of have a design in my head what it would look like. I'm probably gonna do that. Get ready, Legos. Get ready, Legos. Watch out. If that or any of the other crazy things I build sound cool, please consider subscribing. It helps me out and you'll get... I was trying to figure out what the constant force spring should be. This is a string that goes up to the ceiling and back down to a weight and that acts as sort of a constant force spring. Although it's weird because it pulls on, it pulls my arm up too. That caused some problems. And uh, I guess the final thing, get notified when I post new videos. See it here. If you'd like to support these projects directly. Yeah, I've had a number of people telling me that the whisker biscuit is bad and that a dropper rest is better, probably at the longer distance, but I just can't imagine that factoring in at the distance that I was doing here. Even for the uh, superstitious value, I will not have a whisker biscuit next time. I will have a drop of rest. Check out my Patreon. That's pretty cool. Thanks for oh, yeah, there's my, that's the little latching mechanism to remove the bow. So uh, otherwise, thanks for tuning in and I will see you all later. Have a good night or wherever your time zone is. For me, it's night. See ya.